Americans for Peace Now presents Settlements Not to Wait. Uh, I'm Jim Klutznik, uh, chair of this session this morning, and I'm uh, a member of the National Finance Committee of J Street, and I'm an active J Street member in the Chicago chapter. Uh, but most appropriately for today's session, I'm the chair of Americans for Peace Now, which is obviously happy to be participants in this conference. I've been involved in Americans for Peace Now since it was founded in 1981 by my boyhood friend from North Forest, Illinois, uh, Mark Rosen, who's now, uh, he now chairs the Jewish Studies Park Department at uh, Queens College and is still very active in Americans for Peace Now. Um, the idea was to support Shalom Akshav, which is Peace Now in Hebrew, uh, Israel's preeminent peace movement, which was founded in 1978. Shalom Akshav is represented here today by its Director General, Yariv Oppenheimer, who will be over here later. And as Shalom Akshav's sister organization, Americans for Peace Now's mission is to educate and persuade the American public and its leadership to support, adopt, and adopt policies that will lead to comprehensive, durable Israeli-Palestinian and Israeli-Arab peace based on a two-state solution guaranteeing both peoples security and consistent with U.S. interests and policy. No? Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, and now, and now I'd uh, like to introduce uh, our moderator for our session today. Um, Deborah Galee, the president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now, and my boss, will be moderating this session today. Uh, in addition to uh, that particular role, she's also she's also a founder and current member of the Board of Chase. So, like myself, we're very much involved uh, with this organization as well as our own. Prior to joining APM, she was selected by President Clinton to serve as the CEO of the 1996 Democratic National Convention held in Chicago. In 1993, uh, Deborah served as Executive Director of the Democratic National Committee and was appointed uh, DNC Chairman by President Clinton in November of 1994. Before that, Deborah worked in education and democratic politics, and uh, I'm going to warn you now, her school marm experience makes her a great moderator if you're all going to experience right now. Deborah? Um, Kim mentioned how long he's been involved with this issue, uh, which was from uh, the early days of uh, our organization, but even earlier than that, many of you in the room probably recognize the name Klutznik. Jim is the son of Philip Klutznik, who was um, Secretary of Commerce in the Carter administration uh, and started many of the Jewish organizations that many of you are and have been involved in. And, um, Jim learned his uh, wisdom in diplomacy and other foreign policy issues as his father traveled around the world. So we're very proud and honored to have Jim as our chair. He actually is my boss, um, in spite of what he may kid about. Uh, I am amazed and thrilled to see all of you here this morning at 8.15 in the morning. I was not expecting this. Um, and uh, as I said to Danny Seidman, uh, as we were sitting here looking out over the room, how wonderful it was to see all these faces, Danny replied to me, the Jews suffer from insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> in, any, in any event, uh, thank you all for being up uh, and at the conference, and particularly at this session this morning. Um, I want to start uh, by introducing um, Yariv Oppenheimer. Yariv is the Secretary General of Peace Now, Shalom Akshav in Israel. And as uh, most of you know, Shalom Akshav Peace 
since now, and particularly at Settlement uh, Watch Project, headed up by Hadi Othan, is the worldwide respected and known as the expert organization um, in uh, settlements. They go out to the West Bank, they monitor them, um, they are the grassroots peace movement in Israel. So Yareen, my question to you is, has the settlement enterprise made the two-state solution uh, impossible, and is it irreversible? Thank you, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. It's very good. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for making the peace now for hosting this uh, uh, event. Uh, I'm happy to be uh, next to my colleagues, a uh, very professional team about the issue of settlements in, in East Jerusalem. Uh, before I will get into the details and the numbers, I would like to say two major messages. The first one is that the settlements are the main obstacle for the two-state solution. We cannot ignore it, this is the main obstacle, and if we, will, if we will imagine the West Bank without any settlements, I think the agreement will be signed in maybe 10-15 minutes. It's really uh, the major problem and the major obstacle for the two-state solution. Having said that, I don't think that there is a no return point regarding settlements. Because the question about the settlements and the way that the settlements will prevent the two-state solution is about the price that Israel and the Palestinians will have to pay in order to keep the settlements and to end the idea of the two-state solution. And if the price of having the settlements will be so heavy to Israel and the Palestinians, so no matter what is the size of the settlements or the amount of settlers living in the West Bank, eventually Israel will have to evacuate. So it's a matter of price, and in my point of view, there is not such a point like a no return point. We will always have to compare what is the alternative, to keep the settlements, or to uh, bring the settlers, most of them, to bring them, not most of them, but most of the settlements, to, to, to dismantle them, and to bring the settlers back. Uh, I would like to show some numbers about uh, the West Bank. And let's start in 1967, no settlements at all, 600,000 Palestinians. In uh, 1977, the beginning of the settlements movement, uh, 24 settlements with 4,000 settlers. Mostly, by the way, in the heart of the West Bank, not so many in the settlements block that were never existed. In 1993, 20 years ago, the Oslo Agreement, we reached to a point that we have 120 settlements and 110,000 settlers. This was the number 20 years ago during the Oslo Agreement. Now, the next, uh, uh, the next slide will show a huge drop, a, a huge uh, increase on, settlement, on the number of settlers. Actually, since the Oslo Agreement 20 years ago until today, the settlers succeed not to double but to triple the numbers. And when you see this, you can be very disappointed and you can feel that uh, maybe we are going to lose the fight for the two-state solution. So this is the bad news, that the settlers succeed to triple the number since the Oslo Agreement until today. By the way, one of the things that I heard from uh, Yossi Bailey a few uh, months ago was that as an Israeli negotiator in the Oslo process, they insist with the Palestinians not to sign a commitment to stop or to free settlements activity. Because the people that ran the negotiation uh, from the Israeli side, they felt that this is something that they have to achieve in order, in order to give a better uh, agreement for the Israelis. He said today that it was a mistake. And the victory then, the diplomatic victory in the beginning of the Oslo process, was a mistake and, and, and he said we have to be careful of what we are winning because eventually we are paying a huge price for that. So Israel tripled the number of settlers. This is one of the reasons why the Palestinians has a lot a less trust on the process, the Oslo process, when they open the television, they see ceremonies and, and speeches about the two-state solution, but when they open the window, they see new settlements or new outposts, and this is totally contradict the, the, the peace process. However, having said that, if we will see uh, where is the big increase 
of the settlement's activity, we will see that we are talking only about three major places uh, uh, in the West Bank. Yeah. If, if you can see the red points, the red big points are the places that you can see a real huge increase of number of settlers. And three, two out of the three major places never been before Oslo. And we are talking about Beitar, Little Modin, Elite, that it's this place and the south. And these places are very close to the Green Line. It's an orthodox uh, uh, city that was built in order to find a housing solution for the orthodox communities in Israel. You hardly can call them a settlers. They didn't come because they want to uh, uh, annex the West Bank or to prevent the two-state solution. The only reason why they came is because they got a housing solution from the government. And these places, Malay Adumim as well, will remain in Israeli territory even according to the Geneva Accord that was signed with the, with the team from the Palestinian side a few years ago. So altogether, if we look at the numbers, we see a huge increase of number of settlers during the last 20 years. But if we look deeper into the details, we can see that the majority of the, of, of the new settlers are not coming to the ideological places, are not uh, uh, making the map totally uh, impossible. Most of the growth, the big growth of settlers is in the settlements block, especially in the orthodox uh, communities. Therefore, the, the people that believe 20 years ago that the two-state solution is the right solution for the Israelis and the Palestinians should continue to believe that this is the same solution for today. Because the map didn't change dramatically. It's true, by the way, that some of the settlements, the ideological settlements, in the heart of the West Bank, doubled the size of, of themselves, doubled themselves during the years. And they are continuing to build and to increase the, the, the size. But when we are talking about community of 500 families, that becoming 1,000 families, and this is big, it's not a strategic change. It's more difficult, it will be more uh, expensive, it will be more difficult mentally for the society of Israel to do this kind of action. But it's not a strategic change. Now, the settlers has today a, a, a campaign uh, led by Danny Dayan, the former chair of the Yesha Council, saying this is the end of the game. You can continue to meet and to gather and to speak about the two-state solution and even to negotiate, but we won't. And he used this number of uh, uh, almost half a million uh, 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 settlers, including East Jerusalem, as an example of why we cannot achieve the two-state solution. We have to say to them, listen, you, get, you, you had success. There are four, you, you, you brought a lot of settlers to the West Bank, and when you drove around the West Bank, you see many settlers. But the state like Israel, that has to decide whether to evacuate most of the settlements, but most, not most of the, of, of the settlers, or to continue the occupation and to lose the Jewish democratic character of Israel, the choice is very clear. And although you made a huge effort and you spent a lot of our taxpayers' money, eventually you didn't succeed to bring million settlers and to change dramatically the map. And the Gaza, uh, the Gaza evacuation, and I will conclude by that, although it was difficult, although people had to leave their houses, although the result is not the best that we expected, still we show to ourselves that if there is a government that is determined to evacuate settlements and to bring the settlers home, they can do it and it can be done. Thank you.